Welcome to Inside Texas Tech. Joining me now is Texas Tech University System Chancellor, Dr. Ted Mitchell, and Texas Tech University President, Dr. Lawrence Skuvenek. Thank you so much for being here. I feel kind of honored the fact that I got both of you on a television set at the same time. I don't think that happens very often. Not very often at all. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Absolutely, and, and thank you guys. You, you both have been big supporters of, of public media here in our community, and I know our viewers really appreciate you coming on uh, to talk with me today, so thank yeah. you. Our and, pleasure. And thanks for the great job you and all the people do here. Thank you so much. Uh, you he's know, trying to one-up me every time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's letting me say something, and then he's one-upping me. Could, I'm working for those uh, soft tosses. That's right, yeah, we could we'd just do the, the one-up game. Um, We've had a lot of big successes. Uh, 86th legislative session has been a huge success for the university system. Um, outside of that, one big success we've had is our athletic department. We've had championships, almost championships, and just huge successes all across the board. How does that sort of dovetail into uh, the larger system and the larger academic? Yeah. I saw that in a very vivid way last week. I went to Colorado to visit alumni chapters in Denver, Fort Collins, and Colorado Springs. And there were two things the alumni wanted to talk about, athletics and the vet school. <laughs> and um, many people made the point, as they were wearing Texas Tech garb, that they get so many responses and questions from people who, who previously never said anything. So you really get a good sense of how that elevates the visibility and reputation of the university. It's been a wonderful experience. And even with the other systems. Remember as we were pulling into the Final Four uh, in basketball, the University of Texas uh, took out an ad congratulating Texas Tech as the representative of the state, saying we wish you well. And uh, as we hit the Final Four, they actually lit up the tower in Austin red and black. So I mean, it really, the athletics, does a lot for a university and for a university system uh, that is really, really hard to measure. Yeah. I hear a and working on one too, they just haven't got it out yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> one day. <Yeah. laughs> President Skubedek, you, you mentioned another big success and the alumni want to talk about and that's, mm -hmm. and that's the vet school. Um, that's a huge system success to have that. Uh, what does that sort of look like? I think a lot of people have heard it, read the headlines, have seen that. Uh, what does that mean for the system uh, and the profile of Texas Tech and for the region? I'm sorry. Well, um, it's, it's enormous. Um, it's the first vet, new vet school in Texas in 100 years. And I think many people were skeptical of whether or not this would be achieved. But when Chancellor Mitchell sort of set the tone for this session, he asked every president to focus on one priority. And for Tech, it was the vet school. But it wasn't uh, just Texas Tech advocating for it. All the other presidents, the chancellor, were down there making the case. And, um, and in the case of the vet school, we let the facts speak for themselves. And so um, this really, I think, gives Tech a certain stature, but this is not about Tech. This is about addressing a need that exists in West Texas and across the state. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. If you look at the, the way we approached this session, it was distinctly different than what we've done previously. Uh, as Dr. Skivnick said, we each focused on just one item uh, per university for the four universities in the system and really tried to focus on just those things. The reason for that is if you look at the folks during session, it's really an interesting uh, time. For 140 days, every single agency in the state, not just the universities, all the community colleges, uh, all of the agencies, TxDOT, uh, Texas Medical Board, everybody has to line up, present your budget, and then have your wish list, if you will, of the things for it. During a good economic time, like what we have now, uh, it's actually, you'd think it'd be easier, but it's actually difficult. Uh, it makes things more difficult because there are so many needs in the state. And what happens is every agency sits down in front of the House Appropriations Committee and the Senate Finance Committee, and you go through this laundry list of all the things you need, they're all great. And so we took the approach, instead of doing that, saying, no, we want to help make it easier for you guys by understanding that each of the universities has one thing that we're looking for, and that's it. Uh, because if we come down with a list of four or five priorities per university, we don't have a priority. And by doing it like that, while giving due deference to Texas A&M for a phenomenal uh, vet school, saying we're, this is not, as Lawrence said, about Texas Tech. 
This is about addressing a need in rural Texas that has gone unaddressed and just, just reminding the folks that this is what this is about. And it worked out quite well. And it creates wonderful opportunities for our students. I think that they, you know, see a need, feel a need. That's kind of the, the, mm -hmm. the role of what this will play. And, and as someone who grew up in this region, uh, hearing from people in agriculture and farming and, and cattle ranching and everything else, this was something that was really, uh, I don't have the exact statistics in front of me, but there was a real problem with uh, kids going to other vet schools and then going on to larger cities. And so this really addresses that need. Um, just today I received a card from a student, and I'm sure the chancellor's got a lot of these, saying thank you for your efforts in securing a, a vet school, because this has been my dream, and I feel like it's more realizable. Mm -hmm. I mean, how thoughtful of a, of a student to send that. Uh, and I think it reflects the fact that there was this unmet demand for the opportunity to pursue a career in veterinary science. And we, we, we hammered those statistics a lot. Sure. The first time that the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board identified a need and actually voted for this was in 1971. So it's been nearly 50 wow. years ago yeah. that people were talking about this particular need, this emerging need in rural areas of the state. And you said something earlier that is really so spot on for West Texas and for rural Texas with this. If you look at the growth of the population of the state of Texas, we're now approaching 30 million people, but only about 15% of those folks live west of I-35. And so if you look at the representation uh, that we have, Lubbock is growing, Amarillo is growing, Midland Odessa is growing, Abilene is growing, San Angelo is growing, El Paso is growing, but not at the rate of Dallas-Fort Worth, Houston, Austin, San Antonio. So we're being outpaced uh, by our brethren in the larger cities in that population triangle. So our, our um, representation shifts as well. So for the first time, we actually had communities all over West Texas locking arms together to say these are the things, these are the initiatives that we're, we're wanting to support as well. There was a very nice acknowledgement of that last week in the Dallas Morning News. There was a, a, a little column of the editorial board and the title was something to the effect as the influence of West Texas wanes, Texas Tech shows how to get it done or something like that and it referred to this sense of collaboration and uh, and actually the chancellor deserves a lot of credit for the way we engage so many different constituencies and we have to be first acknowledge our representatives from west texas uh, in, in austin they were fabulous they all worked together that we had all of our state senators all of our state reps were all working together and it was pretty impressive uh, to see uh, a senator from lubbock really hammering home the need for a vet school in Amarillo. And to see a senator in Amarillo uh, working on the initiative for a mental health institute in Lubbock. And to see all these state senators working on a dental school in El Paso. Uh, and and we, have, we have grown far past the point that out here in West Texas, we can throw rocks at each other. Uh, if we do that, it's not that, that there is some nefarious plot over in the eastern half of the state to do us wrong. Sure. It's just we're not on their radar. Yes, yes. And if we're standing out here throwing rocks at each other, we will never get anything accomplished in Austin. And you mentioned a, another big accomplishment of the session, which is the Woody L. Hunt uh, School for Dental Medicine. You and, better believe it. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So if you look again at the needs of health care in West Texas, including animals, uh, this has always been an issue. And, and what's interesting about it, and, and one of the part of the story that we're telling in Austin with this is, you look at the folks out here, whether it's dental medicine, whether it's uh, uh, um, uh, normal medicine with, with the remainder of the human body, whether it's veterinary medicine, whether it's nursing, whether it's pharmacy, all of those things are great needs out here, and yet uh, most of the schools for this are over in the eastern part of the state. The great thing about what we have in West Texas, the secret weapon, is that while we may only represent 15% of the population, if Texas were to be a standalone nation, we'd have the 10th largest economy in the world. Our economy is larger than all of that of Canada. And that economy is based on two things, agriculture and energy, mm -hmm. both of which are centered in West Texas. So our secret weapon, and when we're chit-chatting with our, our friends in Austin, is to remind them, you've got to take care of the people's needs 
that are taking care of your needs. And so the dental school is critical. The vet school is critical. Mental health is critical. Down at Angelo State, uh, working on things for student enhancement. They do a marvelous job at bringing students into their university who are first generation college students. And so it's far beyond just teaching them history, English, math, physics. It's about teaching them uh, oftentimes about personal finances, about making sure that they don't overburden themselves with debt that they don't need to overburden themselves with. And so all of these initiatives that we're working on, there is a ripple effect, not just across West Texas with it, with the results of it, but there's a ripple effect all across the state with it. And one of the things at the university here at Texas Tech is enrollment. I feel like I've been here eight years and every semester there's a new announcement of the enrollment has gone up and up. Uh, that enrollment increase leads to greater revenue, which then feeds back into research. How does, that, how does that work and how does that benefit the university overall? Well, for this session, we saw about a 6% increase in what we call our general revenue. And that reflected the fact that the state uh, put more money to cover growth in Texas, growth in enrollment, and then also Texas Tech grew. Um, so we've had 10 consecutive fall semesters of record enrollment, um, but it is a challenge to keep uh, that level of growth, and we have to eventually decide where we're going to end up, because these students don't come from our backyard. Um, about 22, 23 percent will come from the area from Amarillo to El Paso and the rest are across the state. So we have to really work at it. And as long as the state's funds higher ed primarily for rewarding enrollment, we have to be cognizant of that. So it's been good, um, and we, but we have to keep hustling. Uh, I think eventually we're going to probably decide that we're at a steady state point, but we're still not there yet. And, and it's not just enrollment that has gone up that sort of put Texas Tech in, in the news, but it's also the fact that it's one of the best, um, the best, best values of universities. Right. There are so many rankings, and it's, just, it's kind of a difficult discussion. I dismiss those that don't reflect us in the way I think they should. <laughs> and mention those like Forbes, best value, something like that. And it's, um, so we've moved up dramatically in the last few years, and it, it re reflects return on investment. And um, we're going to have a retreat in, in May, and, and, and the chancellor was telling us the other day we need to focus on three priorities. And then he said, there's going to be a sort of system-wide priority. It's going to be debt, transferability. So that's very much part of our culture. How do we provide the best experience at a great value? And we do a pretty good job of it, but we all continue to work on it. And keep in mind that, that the, the groups that you're really trying to focus upon uh, to help in this, it's all the elected officials. They know uh, that, that as the state budget increases, and, and it, we, did a, we had a really good session with funding this year, but if you look at the state budget and break it down, uh, and look at it like the face of a clock. From about 12 o'clock down to about 4 o'clock, that's all Medicaid. Mm. And from about 4 o'clock to close to 9 o'clock is all K through 12, public education. And then from 9 o'clock up till just past 10 o'clock is higher ed. So if you look at just those three areas, you've taken up the lion's share of the entire state's budget. Everything else uh, the highways, safety, everything else is in that last little bit. So at some point in time, it's incumbent upon us in higher education to say, look, we're, we're trying to do our best to, to, to squeeze down this part of the state's budget as well uh, by working on the things that we have control over. And so if you can do things to make sure that dual credit hours are, are what the students need to be taking in order to get in their field of study, mm -hmm. if you can make sure that transferability is what it needs to be uh, from the community colleges to the four years, and if you make sure that, we are, that we're teaching students about not taking on additional debt when they don't need to, then we're doing not just the student a favor, we're actually doing the state a favor as well. So for us, that's a big priority before the ne next session. And that's, and that's a big thing that, that we've seen in the media, the idea that students taking on, I, I don't know the exact number, it's, it's in the, I believe the trillions as far as how much student debt there is right. uh, throughout the country. Um, that's a real value to have. It's, it's something that I feel like a lot of people have felt in the past that it's lacking, that education on not taking on that debt and making wise choices uh, so that's a that's a really 
great thing for students to have that. And there's some clickbait in that information. They'll say it's 16 trillion. Um, a lot of that is for graduate and professional education. Uh, you could go to the United States Department of Education sc College Scorecard and you'd see the average debt for a tech student listed at slightly over 21,000. But when you dig deeper into those statistics, you see a kind of the problem. About little less than 60% of our students will graduate with debt. That's pretty good, 40% have none. But those who have the debt tend to have about 35,000, which is still not an unreasonable number, but it's still going to be a focus for us to see what we can do to lessen that amount of debt. And to really educate students about it, I think, is, is, is key, right? right? To make sure they know what they're getting into when they right. choose their different degree plans and, and their course hours and things of that nature. The best thing they could do is graduate in four years. That's right. And, and one of the things, and Texas Tech does a great job of this, as does Angelo State, if you can get students to stay here during the summer terms, uh, they get a lot of discounts for being here during that period of time. And what it does is it helps to ensure that they graduate on time. That is absolutely the best thing that they can do. And if you look at anything that you can do, whether it's making sure they don't take an additional class if they don't need it, uh, to, to whether it's taking the right number of hours per semester, mm -hmm help keep them on pace. There are a lot of things you can do, but, but beyond that, remember when you were in college, by the time you roll around to your junior year and your senior year, certainly you start getting all the credit card applications and everything else. And it's not just about uh, debt that they're acquiring from the federal government, but all these other things that, that start coming available to them, we've got to make sure that these students are not taking out loans that they don't need. And so part of the process is, uh, is to make sure to educate them in something that is a life skill, not just an education. Both of you have spent a lot of time at Texas Tech, mm -hmm. a lot of time at the system in many varying different capacities. What makes Texas Tech special, different, unique from you know, other universities in our region, our area, our country? Can I, start? Um, I would say you say leadership. <laughs> I, no, I wasn't actually. <laughs> um, there's a culture here that, um, uh, I'll give you an example. It's kind of a long-winded one, quickly. Sally Murray sent me a brochure recently. From Grover the, Murray's wife. Grover Murray's wife from um, the 1960s. And I wrote her a letter last week to thank her for that. And I said, it's very interesting for a lot of reasons. It mentions the new library built at a cost of $2 million, And now we're going to be renovating the Dairy Barn at $3 million. It mentioned the University Theater, now the Majin Theater. <clears throat> I don't know what that costs, but we put $43 million. And I said, those are just elements that reflect inflation in time. But if you read that brochure, there's a certain spirit that's unchanged and it's about the students. And as we become more research intensive, this is a point we really try to make among our faculty. You're here for the students. And 40,000 is getting large, but we still want them to have that same personal connection to the faculty and to each other. Well, that is it. And I think at the, at, the, at the heart of it, it is that. You can come out uh, to an area that most people don't know much about in West Texas, you can be part of something that is a really large Division I uh, experience, but you can do it in a way that has two things. It has a down-home feel, as large as the campus is and everything else, and it has that can-do attitude. Uh, the same thing with, with uh, the, the letter that Sally Murray sent in with the brochure. Across the street at the Health Sciences Center, if you go back and look at the book, The Eye of the Storm, that was about the development of the Health Sciences Center, the School of Medicine, and just read about that West Texas can-do attitude, the tenacity that they had to have. When that medical school was opened uh, in Drain Hall, we had no anatomy lab. We had no place to keep cadavers. So the first professor of pathology drove a U-Haul truck to Dallas loaded 12 bodies in the back of it and drove out here and in the dark of night put them into the kitchen at Drain Hall, wow. which was where the cadavers were stored, and then the dining hall at Drain Hall was the gross anatomy lab. I'm not sure that you could even legally do that today, sure. but it was exactly that kind of, of approach that this is the way we have to do this if we're going to make it work. 
What challenges does a university, a university system face in today's ever-changing world? I, I look at an example of media and what we're in here, and it's just rapidly changing every day, the way people consume media and all those types of things. Higher education is the same way. It's, it's evolving based on the economy, uh, you know, the jobs that are out there. What are some of the biggest challenges you two foresee looking into the future? Um, I think the whole principle of higher ed makes sense when students get the benefit of a college degree. And so related to that is the fact that our biggest challenge is to make sure that one who begins down that path gets that degree. And so our graduation rates, our retention, student success is still the thing that we spend so much time on. Um, of course, we, we deal with the issues in securing support, raising money, and enhancing our research profile. Uh, but all of that is kind of complementary to what I think our biggest challenge should always be. Are we enabling students to ch in a way that changes their life? And that really hasn't changed. The parameters that we work within have become different and there's a lot of issues we deal with now. In some ways it, the university has changed but, uh, and sometimes that creates some tension. Sure, and if you look at this, the world that the students have grown up in now, the world is much smaller. So you get students oftentimes that are getting to college now, the world they've grown up in, they've been steeped in social media, uh, they've been steeped in instant gratification, uh, they've been steeped in, in, a, in a media uh, that allow them to do things online in a way that we never could growing up, and, and it's a double-edged sword. On the one hand, you can deliver coursework in a way that we never could uh, prior to this time, but on the other hand, uh, you have the challenges of, of that delivery. And so I think that maintaining the quality of what it is that you do, so that upon graduation, it doesn't matter from which of our universities, upon graduation, they are uh, a, a member of that community that contributes back to that community in a way reflective of the education they received while they were here. Yeah. Yeah. That's part of making the case that the residential's experience is still worth it. Yeah when they can get it online, but they gain something here when, when brains rub against each other that you can't get online. Two major milestones, uh, 50 years for Health Sciences Center. Uh, what does that mean for the system? What does that mean for the Health Sciences Center to sort of celebrate and look back at 50 years of success and to see that it's still growing and going to continue to have sec success far into the future? Well, you know, it's interesting because we've always thought of ourselves on the Health Sciences Center side. As, as a young university, when you look around at UTMB that's been here since the 1800s, et cetera, et cetera. But here you are, you kind of blink, and you're 50 years into it. So we're not, by any stretch, a young university with it. But it gives you a pause for reflection about what it took to get us here, getting back to Drain Hall. Uh, there were a lot of people along the way that never thought we'd make it. As late as the mid-80s, in 1985, Paul Berker wrote a, uh, an article in Texas Monthly saying, if you want to save money for the state of Texas, close up medical school. It's a black hole of money out there at Texas Tech. Well, thankfully, folks didn't listen to that. And so now we have the largest health science center in, in the state. And we're doing exactly what those folks in the legislature and what Governor Smith wanted done back in the 60s, and that's providing these health care providers for this region. And, and one of the things, another success at the legislative session was $5 million uh, for a uh, mental health sure. program to continue that for rural school districts, which ties back into all of the issues we've kind of talked about is serving those communities out here uh, that, like you talked about, when we come together and work together on things and, and, and sort of operate as one, um, there's great success. But a lot of times people forget in, in, in the minutia of all that, that there's all these little communities that have a lot of needs. And so right. that's an important one. Science it's hugely program. important. And in addition to just those students in high school, you'll notice that across 4th Street, we're building a new VA super clinic, 100,000 square feet, 30,000 of which is purely for mental and behavioral health. So there, there are populations in this region that have gone, I won't say neglected, but they've not gotten the attention that they would have gotten had they been in a larger uh, community. And President Skubanek, 100 years for Texas Tech University. <clears throat> what does that mean, looking back, looking forward, but also what does that mean to you to, to, to be here and be the leader of the university as we start a new century? Um, it's a terribly exciting opportunity. We've already begun to plan for it. There's a committee in place. Um, we're in the process of preparing, uh, there'll probably be many publications, but one book. It's called 100 Voices for 100 Years. 
And we're picking certain people to tell their story. And some of these names may not be that well known, but they represented something unique in the evolution of the university. Um, we're going to kick this off in December of 22 at the Carol of Lights, mm. have a few events during the year, and then conclude it with the Carol of Lights in 23. And so we'll be communicating, giving people a lot of chances to get involved. But it's, it's, I think more than just recounting what we did, we want to send a message about what we want to be. Yeah. And that, so we'll, we'll be working on that. That's excellent. W one of the, the great things that I've loved in, in my time here in Lubbock and in, Tex in the Texas Tech uh, family is, is the stories. Are those stories you hear from people and the people that you meet? Uh, so many people who have graduated from here obviously have gone on to, to huge and successful uh, careers across every industry. And then a lot of people stay in Lubbock and Lubbock's their home and they do great things for the city. And that's one thing that I've enjoyed um, is hearing these great stories from alumni, from the community, people who may never even have gone to Texas Tech, but support the university because it means so much to the community. I imagine both of you see that and feel that uh, every day. Regularly, and on the Health Sciences Center side, keeping in mind that we're on multiple campuses, uh, very often you're with groups of folks that aren't tech alumni, but they absolutely understand the impact that tech has on their community. And as you said, they're ones that will oftentimes step up to help the cause even when they went to other, other universities. And that's very gratifying to know uh, that it, it's, it's indicative of the impact that our institutions are having on the larger community around us. That reminds me of a story, <laughs> one of Ted's famous lines. But, but um, we're going to have a workshop here this fall from September 28th to October 2nd. Uh, and David Byrne is going to be here for a couple of days. It's called Theater. It's called the Theater of the Mind. It's going to be a big production. They're going to open in Denver and then hopefully get it to Lubbock. But um, somebody told me I should call a, a lady who lives not in this state, who's never been to tech, she's not a tech person, because she would want to support this event. So I called her and she made a nice contribution. And she said, I'm really impressed by the emerging profile of tech. And, by, and she elaborated in terms of the support of the arts, the greater diversity of the campus. And I think it's, it's good, like, to, like the Chancellor was just saying, when people outside the university see this, it, it's uh, reassuring and reaffirming, I think, of what we're trying to do. That's excellent. Well, well, with you guys, time flies. We are out of time, but I want to thank you both so much for, for coming on and chatting with our audience today. I know the public media viewers really appreciate your time and, and hearing from you both. Thank you Thanks for having us. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you for joining us. For more, go to KTTZ.org.